We're a month away from Election Day in the River City and picking a new Jacksonville mayor, another candidate for the office. Frank Kiesler joins us to make his case to voters. Plus, what will the next mayor of Jacksonville face in the next four years? Our political analyst Rick Mullaney joins us with a look at what's at stake in this election. And it's an incredible story about building bridges. I believe that a missed opportunity for conversation is a missed opportunity for reconciliation. The black musician who takes every opportunity to engage members of the KKK and other hate groups on This Week in Jacksonville. So glad you're with us today. Since you've been watching the past few weeks, you know that we are on a mission to bring you interviews with each of the men or women running to be Jacksonville's next mayor. Over the past three episodes, we've interviewed seven candidates. You can find those online right now. And right now, Frank Kiesler is joining us, running as a Republican. Uh, you told me I could call you Frank. Thank you. Call me Kent. Please. Thank Tell you, Kent. Tell us why you're running, and, uh, and then we'll get into some of the details. I there. think it's best uh, capsulated in what I said when we had the mayoral forum at the road. Uh, club downtown in November and that was unlike anybody else in this race I'm not running for mayor of Jacksonville I couldn't run from the call to run for mayor of Jacksonville God put a call on my heart in the summer of 2020 and if people people have asked me the kind of pinnacle point was when our mayor took down our uh, the memorial statute or, or column in Hemming Park in the middle of the night there's nothing done in our democracy and in legitimacy that's done under the color of darkness. And more importantly, because of a long history with the black community, I'm just tired of us pandering and placating, you know, the, the, the black community with gestures that don't change anything. And if you do a survey, and I have a lot of black people in my campaign, two years later going on three, there's nothing that's better in the black community in the United States of America or in Jacksonville because of the mid, in the middle of the night a mayor took down a statute. I think government needs to be transparent and things done in darkness are a little bit of an anathema. It's interesting. So what does transparency in a Frank Kiesler administration, what does that really mean? That means that every time you hear me speak, you're going to hear the same man. Uh, I tell people and it's interesting. Uh, I'm named Frank, and it's not a, a, an anathema to my personality. It is a very descriptive label. And I'm a, I have a law degree. I have a tax law degree. I'm a CPA. Uh, that is, tends to be a very, you know, quantified bottom line. Usually very direct. And, and, <laughs> and people want that. The, the people are longing for somebody just to be t t who they are every time, and nothing ever changes. In fact, last night I spoke at a, at a uh, forum uh, put on by the uh, Stand for Jacks uh, organization. And, and it, a lot of the people, some of the people that were there were there to another one that was on the north side. Some of the questions, in fact, I think the questions were identical. But the wonderful thing is the people came up to me after and said, you know, you said the exact same thing to the questions that were asked tonight that were asked of you. They didn't change. They didn't change. Uh, yeah. Well, so we've asked viewers to submit questions that they want answers uh, from candidates for. So I'm going to go to one here. This is from Rex Fairholm. What is your plan for getting all of Jacksonville's neighborhoods off of septic tanks that are dangerous for the environment? You know, the, a lot of surveys have been submitted or have been submitted to all the candidates, and they tend to have a common theme in them, and one or architecture, and that is that, you know, what's your most important? Right. It's like after 50 years of running bad government in our country, in our state and our nation, and surely not retooling after 50 years. There's a lot of issues there. So I think fundamentally the answer is sh find me the money, so to speak, without raising taxes and without cutting services. Well, anything run as badly as government's been run in the last 50 years, you can rest assured a turnaround professional can go hunt the waste, the rats and the cheese, the, you know, the antiquation, I have a man on my committee that spent 37 years inside the city of Jacksonville as a, a professional engineer in the environmental engineering department, right on this issue. Yeah. And in fact, not to tangent, but I was the only candidate to show up at the UNF Environmental Symposium this year. And it's huge what's going on in our world, and septic tank leaching is one of the, but the clear ordinance, it's in our freeing vision. The comprehensive local examination, audit review, recommendation, and restructuring. We need to retool the way we deliver services. It's amazing how much paper there is in our government today, and that's wasting money. If you think everything's run above board and incredibly without corruption or 
favoritism. There's still that kind of waste. Find that money, we have the money. Uh, think about it, if, if you find Sound 5% on a $1.7 billion discretionary budget. Big budget. $85 million. Yeah. So let me ask another question here, and I've been trying to ask every candidate this one. Several viewers want to know how candidates will deal with the Jaguars and the stadium. So this is from Melody Brunson. How much will you give in to anything Shad Khan wants, especially in light of the Jags doing better? He should not run this city. What are your thoughts? If we run a city of, of people, you, can, uh, our campaign is a movement it's been described as, and it's an awakening building together a city of people with their heads lifted and creating a, 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 a unity, a coalescence around this, this moniker pen. Red, yellow, black, white, brown. We all have purpose and meaning wherever found. The Creator knows and loves all the people of the world. If you and I can't get there, how, we get it, how do we get anything done? If we do get there, tell me what we cannot do in this city to change it. When you create that kind of city, you don't have to give away the store. There's an old saying, I spent my career in doing business deals primarily and large scale, you know, seven, eight figure, nine figure deals and capitalization, financing, et cetera. You don't, there's an old saying, you can always make a deal if you give away the store. We can always sell every piece of inventory if we give it away. And Jacksonville is a premier city in this country and therefore when it comes down to our investments, what I believe the structure and the philosophy ought to be, we're gonna extend capital but after the private capital has been returned or an ROI, IRR has been earned, the Jaguars are now worth 1.2 billion or 1.9 billion, whatever that valuation is, we get our capital back. We don't want to return on our capital. Our investment is in you and bringing that additional economic impact. But once you've sustained a level of really high performance in the investment that we've made, just give us back our capital so we can go do it again. There's a Jewish loan fund in New York City that does that. They don't charge any interest. And they have like a 90% repayment rate. Uh, that's the way we ought to approach, I think, all capital investment. Strike a deal that says we're in, but once we reach a level, you, the private sector, reach a level of IRR, then, because understand. Kent, so we're, we're out of time, time for this segment. So one of the things I'm doing, I'm trying to make sure that every candidate has exactly the same amount of time. So I'm, I'm sorry to cut you no, off. No, no, do for it. We've Go asked for additional me. questions. They're part of our voter guide that's going to be up on our, our News for Jack's website soon. Thank you for your time, and we're looking forward to seeing you here in a few weeks for a mayoral debate. Uh, well, thank you, and thank you so much for your time today. All right. So coming up, we're staying focused on the mayor's race, but stepping back for the bigger picture, our political analyst Rick Mullaney joins us to explain what's at stake in this city of Jacksonville in the election coming up. All right, so if you're only joining me Sundays for This Week in Jacksonville, you're missing out. Be sure to subscribe to my weekly Twidge newsletter, real bonus for News for Jacks insiders. Just head to newsforjacks.com slash newsletters and then click to sign up under This Week in Jacksonville. You're watching This Week in Jacksonville with Kent Justice. Welcome back. As we've been introducing you to the candidates for mayor over the past few weeks, we're now going to take a step back. We're going to look at the bigger picture in this race. What's at stake for the city and what will make the next four years different for this mayor compared to what past mayors have faced? Joining us right now, News for Jack's political analyst, Rick Mullaney, the Shirkliff Executive Director of Jacksonville University's Public Policy Institute. So, Rick, what's the answer? This is... This is big. How is this different than other mayoral campaigns that we've seen and, and the job that's going to have to be done in these next four years? A couple things to keep in mind. The mayoral race in Jacksonville is different, and it's different from other places around the state, in part because of our form of government. Back in 1968, a lot of attention is paid to consolidation, rightfully so. But what gets missed in that restructuring is we created a strong mayor form of government. And what that means is that the mayor heads up the executive branch. Come July under our charter, they'll propose a budget, over $1.5 billion operating budget. They'll appoint department heads, they'll have veto authority. The strong mayor form of government, which is unique in Florida, puts the mayor of Jacksonville playing a very important leadership role in our city. So that's number one, it's an important position. And number two, Kent, Come July 1, whoever's our next mayor is going to face some very significant challenges. Unlike what we've seen in the past, some great opportunities, but some very serious challenges. It's an important mayor's race. You know, this week we were talking with voters uh, about what they're picking up on from candidates for mayor. And so I want you to hear this. One woman told us that she's not really hearing what she says she needs to hear from these potential city leaders. They talk about stuff that doesn't really matter to regular everyday people. They, they don't address those real issues. They talk about little 
issues they may have with that person, you know, the JEA thing, they'll focus on stuff like that instead of focusing on the things that are actually going to affect my day-to-day life, my kids' lives, people that actually improve things here in, in Jacksonville. So that's the sad part that they don't ever focus on the stuff that really matters in the end. Rick, what do you say to her? She says stuff that really matters in the end, that's not what they're focusing on. You know, Kent, I think she's reflecting a sentiment that's pretty widespread in Jacksonville. There is a desire in this community to hear about the issues, and I think a growing frustration over negative campaigning that many believe has gone too far. Uh, one of the things that we're certainly going to do in the debate on March 8th is to focus on the issues, and there are big issues facing Jacksonville. I mentioned earlier the budget is going to be a big challenge in the future, but there's other big issues, public safety, development of the riverfront, downtown development, infrastructure, and of course, the Jaguars and a potential stadium deal that could be up to a billion dollars. So I think the community wants to hear about those issues. They'll have a chance with our televised debate on March 8th. But I think overall, the negative campaigning has gone a little bit too far in the eyes of many, and there is this desire to focus on the issues. Yeah, and as you mentioned, so our debate just a few weeks away here. But there are eight candidates when you include the write-in, the qualified write-in, Brian Griffin, but multiple Democrats, multiple Republicans, no party-affiliated candidates. How's a voter to kind of sift through that? You, you can't just say, well, there's my, I like this party, I'm going to vote for that person because many people here. Well, you know, Ken, a couple things is here in Jacksonville, of course, it's a unitary election, which means that Republicans and Democrats are running together. It, and, and the community have an opportunity both in, in listening to the candidates and the televised debate and to learn as much as they can. But there's a sense that maybe two Republicans might advance because remember, two go to the runoff on uh, in May 16th. Uh, that two Republicans will advance or two Democrats, but what is most That's likely? It's difficult, right? It's very difficult. Yeah. Most likely you're going to see one Republican advance and one Democrat advance, and they will go to the runoff in May. And so for now, we're still over a month away. Um, not everyone has tuned in just yet. Uh, they'll pay more attention as the, as the election draws closer, but it is right around the corner. I expect the voters will start tuning in. And when they do, like I said, I think they want to hear about the issues. You mentioned that some of the advertising, the campaigning has gone negative already. Would there be even more if it comes down to just two people in that runoff? You know, Ken, it was widely expected that the race would go negative. They're competitive. They do go negative. It has gone negative. It has exceeded what most people have expected. Given what we've seen so far, you can expect negative ads to go th into the future heading towards Election Day. Um, by the way, it's really risky for the candidates, especially when you have seven people running on the stage. If candidate one goes negative and they may aim at, negative, uh, aim at candidate two, it doesn't mean they're going to get the votes. It might go to the other five. It's challenging with multiple people in the race if you have a negative campaign ad on one as to where that vote's going to land. And the beneficiaries right now appear to be those who are not going negative. Well, and that's what I was going to ask. Does it uh, help a candidate? And we've got one minute left in our segment, but does it help a candidate to just kind of lay in the weeds or stay out of the fray until it gets closer to election day or something? You know, it depends on what race you're in and it depends on the candidate. Certainly for the Democrats, for Donna Deegan, for Audrey Gibson, to a large extent Al Ferraro, wise strategy could be stay positive, stay above it, get your name out, campaign hard. Uh, for those who are going negative, they tend to hurt each other and that can be very, very challenging. So one of the strategies that I think is most likely, at least through this first race, is a number of candidates will try to stay above it but those that are involved in that negative race, it's very risky for them because they can bring the numbers down for both of them. Thank you very much, Rick. And what Rick was mentioning, next month you're going to have a chance to hear from the candidates on the issues as we bring them together on stage at Jacksonville University for our Jacksonville May World Debate. It's March 8th, 8 p.m. You can watch it right here on Channel 4 and on News4Jax.com and streaming on news 4 Jacks Plus. So when we come back, we're shining the spotlight on a man who spoke in Florida this month and he told his incredible story. Daryl Davis joins us and explains how he started the conversations that have led 200 people to renounce a life of hate. That's next on This Week in Jacksonville. You're watching This Week in Jacksonville on Channel 4. It's Black History Month, and I got a chance to speak with a man who has an incredible story. He gave a speech called Hate Undone for a group called Florida Humanities in the Village Square. Music is the vocation for Daryl Davis, but his fascination has been going where few would dare. This black man in his 60s has spent decades coming in close contact with members of the Ku Klux Klan, working to help them see another way. Music became my profession. But studying race relations became my obsession. And uh, there came a time when I joined a, a country band, country music band. Country music had made a resurgence. 
And uh, I was the only black guy in the band and generally the only black guy where we played. We played a place in a town called Frederick, Maryland, which is a suburb of, uh, well, not a suburb, but about an hour and 20 minutes outside of Washington, D.C. It was a, it was an all white uh, club uh, lounge called the Silver Dollar Lounge. There were no signs that said whites only, anything like that, but it had a reputation. And you know, when you go somewhere uh, where you know you're not welcome and alcohol is being served, <laughs> it's not a good combination. Is is this late 70s, early 80s? No, this is, uh, this is the 80s, man. This is the 80s. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And so I'm in the Silver Dollar Lounge and um, we just finished playing a set. I'm the only black person in there. I'm taking the break, following the band over to the band table. And I felt somebody from behind come up and put their arm around my shoulder. Now, I don't know anybody in here. So I'm you know, trying to see who's touching me. And it was a white guy, at least a decade and a half older than me. And he says, man, I sure love your piano playing. This is the first time I ever heard a black man play piano like Jerry Lee Lewis. And I was not offended, but I was surprised that he didn't know the origin of Jerry Lee's style, being older than me. And uh, I said, well, you know, Jerry Lee got it from the same place I did, from black blues and boogie-woogie piano players. Well, he didn't believe that either. I said, listen, I know Jerry Lee Lewis. You know, he, he was a good friend of mine. He didn't believe that. But he wanted to buy me a drink. I went back to his table. I had a cranberry juice. And then he tells me this was the first time he ever sat down and had a drink with a black man. And now I'm completely baffled. So I, I said, you know, why is that? Long story short, he reveals to me that he's a member of the KKK. So that's where that started. And um, it, not that night, but... You know, he gave me his phone number and wanted me to call him whenever I came over to that to that uh, lounge to play again. He wanted to bring his friends, meaning the ones, we you know, with the wow. With the point. Yeah. So, Daryl, I, I don't mean to stop the story, but what was your reaction in that moment? Did you did he explain that he was part of the KKK at that time? Yeah. And I was laughing until he went in his pocket, went through his wallet and handed me his Klan membership card. Now, I know a lot about the Klan. And I recognized the Klan insignia, a red circle with a white cross and a blood drop in the center. I stopped laughing. It was for real, you know. But he was very friendly and very curious about me. And so, you know, we talked about the Klan and some other things. He gave me his number, wanted me to call him whenever I played back here so he could bring his friends. And I'd call him. He'd come with Klansmen and Klanswomen, not in robes and hoods, but, you know, in regular street clothes. And so that went on until the end of that year. Um at which time I quit the band and went back to playing rock and roll and whatever else was going on. And I lost track of the guy. But then a few years later, it dawned on me, Daryl, get back in contact with that guy because he holds the answer to your question. At the age of 10, I had formed a question in my mind after being pelted in the uh, scouts. The question was, how can you hate me when you don't even know me? The people I'd asked, Oh, Daryl, you know, some people are just like that. That's just the way it is. Well, that's not an answer for me. And I bought books on black supremacy, white supremacy, the Klan, anti-Semitism, the Nazis in Germany, the neo-Nazis over here. They all talked about the ideology, but didn't explain why. So I thought, you know, now I'm, a, I'm an adult. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a professional musician. Get back in contact with that guy because he holds the answer. Who better to ask that question of, than someone who would go so far as to join an organization with over a hundred year history of practicing hating people who don't look like them or don't believe as they believe. So that's where the journey started. Well, that's where it, it continued. Daryl, let me ask you about the, the work that you do. What is it, what is in a conversation with Daryl Davis that would convince someone who's part of one of these groups like the KKK, hey, that's that's not the truth. That's not what I want to pursue the rest of my life. What is the change that happens when they have a conversation with you? In the conversations, I'm just a regular person. I'm interested in hearing what you have to say. Tell me why I should believe the way you believe. Convince me. I'm all ears. And I give them that platform, which is what, what they're not used to from somebody that they, you know, have animus towards, right? Uh, I'm I'm willing to give them that. I show them that respect. And when I say respect, I don't mean I respect what they're saying, but I respect their right to say it. And in doing so, 
it brings the temperature down because, you know, you can't uh, impact somebody when their ears are shut and, they, and they're ready to do battle. You know, you got to bring the temperature down. Temperature comes down, the ears open up. So when you show them, you know, that kind of respect, allow them to be heard, then there's a chance that they will reciprocate and listen to you. I never try to change somebody's reality. One's perception is one's reality. Even if it's wrong, if they perceive it, it becomes their reality. And as soon as you attack their reality, you're going to get pushback. So the so the best thing you can do is not attack somebody's reality, but offer them a better perception or perceptions. And if they resonate with that perception, they will then change their own reality. And that's what I do. All right, we want to offer you more from that incredible interview with Daryl Davis. His journey began when he was a 10-year-old, the only Cub Scout of color in his pack, and he was attacked at a parade. You're going to find that story and our entire interview when you join us on News for Jax Plus. It's available on Roku, Apple TV, Fire Stick, Android TV, Chromecast. Just search News for Jax on your streaming device. Download it. It's free. And then once you're there, you're going to find this interview under the This Week in Jacksonville channel. Uh, there is so much going on locally and across the state. Next time, uh, government law attorney Chris Hand is joining us for our Hand on Government segment. This week in Jacksonville airs each Sunday morning at this time. I'm Kent Justice. Thanks for watching on air on Channel 4 and the CW17 and online at newsforjax.com or streaming on News for Jax+. Plus. See why every day more people are choosing News 4 Jax.